那我们第二位已经上线有一段时间嘉宾啊，是图文奖得主，呃 ，Joseph s i f a k i s 我们先看一段他的介绍视频。Joseph s i f a k i s 二零零七年图灵奖得主，欧洲科学院和法国科学院院士，美国文理科学院和美国国家工程院院士，中国科学院外籍院士。Joseph 是国际著名嵌入式系统专家，曾于1993年创建了 Verimac 实验室，因开发 Lost 同步语言而闻名于世。Joseph 在1981年曾独立提出模型检测方法，这一方法被广泛应用在芯片检测、通信协议、嵌入式系统、安全算法等领域。2007年。Joseph 因在模型检查理论和应用方面做出的卓越贡献，而被授予图灵奖，成为法国首位获此殊荣的科学家。2009年 ，Joseph 获得了希腊议会主义和民主议会奖。2012年，获得利奥纳多·达芬奇勋章。Joseph 积极致力于将科研成果向工业合作伙伴转让。作为欧洲卓越网络嵌入式系统设计研究联盟技术协调人，他负责对三十五个欧洲研究小组的研究进行协调，来推进欧洲在嵌入式系统设计理论和应用上的发展。Hi, Joseph. Hi, do you hear me?、Uh, yeah, you, you can share your screen now. Okay, so、uh, let me share my screen. What's that? Yes,、uh, here it is. Share. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. It's okay. So can I start? Do you、yeah. hear me? Yeah, it's your okay. Time. Okay. So let me start. Let me move this window a bit. Okay. So、uh, good afternoon, everybody from France.、Uh, I'm Joseph Sifax. I'm going to talk about autonomous systems. I've been studying this topic for.、Uh, Many many years now, and、uh, the question is whether we should trust autonomous systems. And、uh, I think that this issue is raised.、Uh, okay, sorry, I cannot uh, uh, move my screen now. Escape. Why I cannot? Yes. Okay, perhaps.、Uh, Share the desktop. Okay, so sorry about that, because.、Uh, Uh, let me see now. I share my screen again, but the problem is that okay. So,、uh, can you see my slides there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just okay. You, okay. Uh, because because if I pass, if I if, yeah, you can see them. Okay. So I I I I, I keep this. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can enter the、uh, play mode, right? You know the full full screen. The full screen mode,、uh, yes, but then yes, then、okay. I cannot. Ah, yes, okay, it works. Okay. So、uh, this issue is raised by the IoT vision. So I'm not going to to explain what is、uh, what IoT is about. You know this. The challenge is to produce global services by using intelligent systems,、uh, collecting data from、uh, billions of devices that are spread over the planet. But what I would like to say here is that this vision covers、uh, two different problems. What we call the Internet of Things, in fact, is、uh, has a segment that uh, some uh, people call the Human Internet of Things, which is a mere improvement of the Internet as we know it、uh, today. You have users that uh, 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 submit、uh, requests and get get some answers. And the most challenging part is the industrial Internet of Things, where the important keyword here is autonomy. And、uh, the idea here is that you will have systems that will、uh, work in an autonomous manner,、uh, without intervention of humans. Humans may change some parameters, and we know many examples of this idea implemented in autonomous transport systems, industry for zero or smart grids. So I'm. Going to talk about this vision and the feasibility of this vision. This is an outline of my talk. Uh, so uh, I'm going to explain uh, what I call uh, uh, next generation autonomous systems. What are the main characteristics? 
I will discuss this issue of transworthiness that is very important because probably you understand that autonomous systems are critical systems. And then I'll talk about design for transworthiness and performance of these systems. And I will advocate the convergence between AI-enabled uh, techniques and uh, conventional systems engineering techniques. So I already said that the uh, next generation autonomous systems emerge from the need to automate existing organization. The idea is to replace human agents by computerized systems. Uh, these systems are critical and uh, they should exhibit some kind of broad intelligence because they should uh, uh, be able to manage possibly conflicting goals. And this is, uh, in fact, reflects the trend of transition from narrow to strong AI. Uh, also, they have to cope with complex uh, environments where you have, say, the physical components there and to harmoniously collaborate with human agents. So today, I think there are serious limitations for achieving uh, this. And uh, one uh, uh, important reason is that uh, these uh, systems should uh, rely on learning-enabled components. And you know that we cannot guarantee their transworthiness just because we don't understand how they work. Also, another problem is the poor transworthiness of the network in infrastructure. And uh, we know a lot about that. We have uh, plenty of security issues. And of course, these systems are overwhelming complexity. And uh, these are the most complex systems we, we have ever designed. So uh, just to consider an example, you consider uh, autonomous vehicles. And uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, I think, is an, an emblematic case. Everybody understands the stakes behind are very, very important. And uh, OK, so. Uh, let me say that in the past, I worked a lot with uh, aircraft and defense systems. Uh, so my background comes from there. And uh, I am surprised to see that for, uh, say, autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicle manufacturers do not follow the classical approach. And uh, you know that critical systems are certified, that uh, once you certify an aircraft, you cannot change. A hardware or software component, and you probably know that Tesla cars uh, in Tesla cars software is updated uh, regularly. So you have plenty of practices that emerge under the economic pressure that are, 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 do not agree with the standard critical systems engineering. And uh, of course, there is a lot of discussion about that. Now you have plenty of people that say oh, let's move on, and we don't care about uh, the lack of guarantees for, for such systems. Uh, so you have different attitudes I like show here. And of course, you have very optimistic people like Elon Musk that says, keep saying that uh, autonomous cars are around, uh, around the corner and, uh, and they will be soon here. Uh, to be frank, I don't share this optimism, and this is what I'm going to explain in my talk. Uh, I think that uh, today we are uh, uh, at a turning point uh, in, in systems engineering. We know how to build the small centralized automated systems, and now we want to build complex decentralized autonomous systems. And uh, first of all, we should understand what we are talking about, uh, because there is a big difference between automated and autonomous systems. Of course, the concept of autonomy has been around since uh, more than 20 years now. Uh, you remember probably that IBM had launched the term of autonomic computing, and there is a lot of literature uh, about autonomous systems, autonomous agents. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I think that we, we need a new theory that cannot be obtained by integrating existing results. And uh, first of all, we should understand for these systems, what they call new generation autonomous systems, what's the difference with uh, automated systems, and uh, what it means uh, to build transworthy systems in this context. And uh, finally, my talk, I will uh, present some ideas about how to, about hybrid design techniques. So let me try to explain uh, what I mean by this concept of autonomy. Uh, and uh, here I will take uh, uh, five different kinds of systems 
a very simple one, a thermostat, an automatic train shaft. You see such uh, shafts in the airports today. And the chess playing a robot, a soccer playing a robot, and the robot car. I'm trying to explain what are the differences. Uh, all these systems com consist, of course, of agents in a thermostat. You have a simple agent, and the goal is just to uh, uh, keep the temperature of a room uh, between some bounds. And uh, okay, then you have uh, more and more complex goals. And let me introduce some vocabulary be before saying what, in my opinion, characterizes an autonomous system. So in an autonomous system, you have agents. Here I'm considering self-driving cars. And each agent has its internal environment. So it can control this environment and its external environment where you have many different objects. Of course, the agent has to interact with its environment so as to achieve a specific goals it has. So of course, each agent has a partial uh, uh, view of a global environment. And the system, of course, encompasses all of these agents. And uh, of course, the system has its own goals. So, and the problem is how the global system goes. So for a transport system, the global system goals is uh, a fluidity of the traffic, is uh, safety in driving. So these goals should be individual goals of the agents. So now if I go back to my five systems and I try a comparison uh, with respect to these three criteria, environment stimulate and the goals, so I think that's have a very simple goal, a uh, very simple environment. I mean, the stimuli is just temperature. And uh, the shuttle, I have designed shuttle uh, systems for shuttle like that. It's not very simple because you can design controllers. The environment is static, if you understand this. And then uh, things become much, much more difficult for the chess robot just because you cannot design a controller. Uh, you have dynamically changing goals, and you cannot you cannot statically build a controller. And uh, then, of course, with a circular robot, you have uh, a dynamic configuration of players. So it's more the, the environment becomes much more dynamic. And for robot car, of course, you can have a changing number of, of agents, and and, and uh, you can imagine this. So. I think that the separation line between automation and uh, autonomy is uh, somewhere there. Uh, so a shuttle and the thermostat uh, are automated systems. And then, and then you have, uh, with increasing difficulty, uh, uh, autonomous systems. I, and I think robocars are a good example of fairly complex uh, autonomous system. So uh, let me try to characterize autonomy in terms of functions, a functional characterization of autonomy. So consider an autonomous agent. The agent receives sensory information and gives commands to its internal and external environments. And in fact, an agent needs two, two things, two modules. One is a situational awareness module that consists of a perception function that receives the sensor information, interprets the sensor information in terms of concepts. And I think also for situational awareness, you need to build a model of the uh, environments you have. And this is very important for decision making. And uh, to make decisions, uh, you need two functions. One is uh, uh, goal management, so to manage goals that may be conflicting also long-term and short-term goals. And then for each goal, you can have planners to generate sequences of commands and act on your environment. So this is a more or less well understood idea. And then if you want to have a very, very intelligent agent, you need a fifth function that is self-learning. Self-learning means that the agent is able to understand the new concepts and to create uh, and to create new goals. And of course, uh, if you have an agent like this one with self-earning capabilities, we are close to human intelligence. Now, this slide summarizes what I said. So autonomy is the capacity of an agent to achieve a set of coordinated goals by its own means without human intervention, adapting to environment variations. And it combines these uh, five complementary functions. So these are ideas I have published in a paper you can find on my webpage. 
And uh, uh, notice that these functions can be mathematically defined. And uh, I'm not assuming anything about their implementation. So perception can be uh, uh, by machine learning and uh, decisions can be model based, okay? And uh, also uh, this, uh, this characterization allows us understanding the difference between automation and autonomy and automated system is just a system that does not need any of these functions. So let me try to explain uh, when we trust a system. So I have worked a lot on, uh, on uh, the development of trustworthy systems, uh, uh, safety critical systems. And this uh, is what I'm explaining here. So uh, when I trust a system to perform a given task, well, it depends. It depends on the task criticality. So uh, you have levels of criticality in systems. Uh, you have seven levels of, of criticality from best effort systems to very critical systems. And uh, the level of criticality uh, uh, characterizes the severity of the impact of an error of, or a failure of the system that performs the task. And then, of course, you can evaluate system trustworthiness. There are techniques for that. And trustworthiness is not about only functional correctness. Is that means that the system would behave correctly despite any kind of mis mishaps. Okay, so here in this uh, diagram, I have normalized criticality and system trustworthiness. So one for trustworthiness means that I trust, fully trust my system. Zero means that the behavior of my system is fully random. And the trust criticality one means that uh, my system is very critical. So, uh, Engineers establish some correspondence between criticality and trustworthiness. So for very critical systems, for instance, avionic systems, the trustworthiness should be very high, 10 to the minus 9 failures per hour of flight, for instance. So there is a, there are, there are, there is a correspondence uh, between criticality levels and trustworthiness. So here I'm assuming simply that for each, uh, so I will trust the system if the task criticality can be matched by system transfer. So what characterizes the area I trust my system is this uh, line, the bisector of this angle I call automation frontier. So for standard automated systems, we have this situation. And of course, uh, we don't trust systems for investing, teaching, nursing, etc. Why? Because we cannot build systems for teaching that are trustworthy enough or efficient enough, whatever. And and uh, and this is the, the the separation between uh, so automated systems and non-automated systems. Now, what will happen for autonomous systems? In my opinion, for autonomous systems we will have a division of work between humans and and uh, and uh, computers and uh, what will happen is that we will have complex tasks like uh, uh, trading radio uh, diagnosis smart grids car driving brain surgery where uh, uh, a part of the task will be uh, uh, performed by the system and a, a part of the task by humans and here, uh, the important thing is what we call, uh, some people call symbiotic autonomy. So how we define this division of work between a human agent and a machine? Assuming that a human agent can override the machine's decision, but also the machine should be proactive and say, oh, hello, I, 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 I need your help, okay? And uh, that, this is a very, very important problem. This is not... Uh, uh, a, a human-machine interaction problem. This is a much, much deeper problem. I hope you understand this. And just to give you a of, uh, of uh, division of work between humans and, and, uh, and systems, uh, these are the autonomy levels of the Society of Automotive Engineers that, that uh, range from level zero, no automation, level five, full automation, so full 
Uh, this means in, the, in my terminology, so that uh, you have fully autonomous system, and then you have intermediate levels where the computer shares the task with, uh, with uh, humans. So typically, for instance, you have this level three here. Level three means uh, that the car drives normally, I mean, the computer drives normally, and uh, uh, in exceptional cases, it will ask the human to intervene. But think about that. There have been many accidents already in this mode of interaction between humans and computers, not only for cars, for aircraft also. So it's it's very hard to design systems that are that are uh, really uh, have this uh, symbiotic property. And this slide uh, again explains this idea of uh, sharing the tasks of division of work between humans and and uh, and um, and machines. And I think this is the future for autonomous systems for the moment, uh, hoping that we'll have fully autonomous systems uh, for critical tasks. So this is completely not realistic. So just to mention an example, I think is realistic is to teleoperated autonomous vehicles, for instance. Okay, now let's move on and say something about uh, knowledge, because uh, this is a very, very important concept in AI. And uh, a very important concept also in in, um, uh, in 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 systems engineering. So uh, I think that people are not aware of the fact that knowledge uh, can take different forms and has different degrees of truthfulness, and uh, that's what I'm going to explain. So I think the previous speaker tried to make this distinction, but. Uh, 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 so our brain has uh, two systems of knowledge. System one, that is, uh, this is very well known about, uh, about these two types of thinking here. I mentioned in Kahneman's book, uh, uh, perhaps you know this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, but this is a very common idea that our brain combines two types of thinking, fast thinking and slow thinking. So fast thinking is non-conscious, automatic, and effortless. And this is the type of thinking we do when we walk, we speak, we play the piano. Uh, so we don't understand how it works, but it works. And then slow thinking is conscious, control, effortful thinking. And this is the type of thinking we do when we solve a mathematical problem. For instance, we, uh, we, we write a program. Now, there is a striking uh, analogy between uh, uh, fast thinking and strong, uh, slow thinking and uh, neural networks and conventional computers. And I invite you to think about that. So a neural network uh, produces knowledge in the way our the system one produces knowledge. Uh, so uh, it's generated from empirical knowledge. So you have some uh, experience. And based on the data and the, the type of experience you have, so uh, you know, you learn, uh, you, you uh, train the network to distinguish between cats and dogs. And uh, this is done exactly as kids learn how to distinguish between cats and dogs. Kids, I mean, nobody understands what is, can give a formal specification of what a cat or a dog is. And then uh, for conventional computers, you have, uh, you have the model-based knowledge. Model-based knowledge is uh, procedural knowledge. You give, uh, you explain step by step what you are doing. And this is uh, this you are, you, you are doing by using your uh, system two of uh, slow thinking. So I, I hope this distinction is, uh, is very clear. And now let me... Uh, uh, talk about the different types of knowledge we handle when we design systems, when also we talk about the world, how we understand the world. Of course, the very uh, 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 simple type of knowledge is facts and syllogies. And then you have implicit empirical knowledge, like the one that is produced by neural nets, but also by, by, by system one of our mind. And then you have scientific and technical knowledge. So this is empirical knowledge, uh, but uh, this it is substantiated by models, and I'm going to explain this. And then you have mathematical knowledge that is non-empirical knowledge. 
And mathematical knowledge is eternal knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, Pythagorean theorem, it holds, it will hold forever. Uh, nobody will say that it is wrong if you accept the axioms, while uh, scientific uh, knowledge is, is, is uh, I mean, can, can be uh, falsified, of course, uh, through experiments. And then you have, of course, meta-knowledge. Meta-knowledge is uh, uh, what some people call wisdom. Now, uh, the bank is, I, I have explained already the basic distinction between a data-based and model-based knowledge. So scientific uh, and mathematical knowledge are model-based and uh, implicit empirical knowledge is data-based. I, I hope you accept these terms. And uh, now uh, in some uh, texts about standards, there is, uh, they use this terminology, I think is, is, is very relevant. So mathematical knowledge is irrefutable. You cannot refute a theorem that you have proven it is correct. Scientific uh, and technical knowledge is conclusive. Conclusive means that it relies on models. You can explore corner cases and you can, you are almost sure that it holds provided your modeling is okay. And, and sufficient knowledge is just, uh, you have uh, some conviction that uh, according to some criteria that may be subjective, that, that this is useful knowledge. So most of the knowledge we handle is, uh, is, is empirical knowledge, implicit uh, empirical knowledge. Uh, now, what happens with the advent of AI enabled techniques? So here we have an explosion uh, between, uh, so the, the empirical implicit knowledge increases. And uh, uh, the interesting fact is that, and this is something that has explained also the previous speaker, you have a predictability uh, for uh, scientific knowledge, but also for, for knowledge that comes from machine learning, but you don't have explainability. You don't, because you don't understand. And this is the problem, I think. When you build a bridge, you have explainability because you have the theory and you know that the bridge will not collapse. Uh, when you are using machine learning techniques, you don't have such guarantees. And this is uh, something I would like to explain uh, in this slide. So uh, the difference between scientific and, uh, and machine learning generated knowledge. So let me consider an experiment in physics. So I am Galileo, I am doing an experiment. I am applying for self and I observe acceleration A. And I'm doing a mental experiment here. I show images, and these are images of cats and dogs. So the outcome of the experiment is that, uh, okay, it's a cat or it is a dog. Now, uh, Galileo observes the, uh, the, the experimental data and says, oh, oh, there is, a, there is a proportionality law, and he gives the law. So F, uh, the well-known law that says that uh, the force uh, is proportional to the acceleration. But what we can say about what does the neural network? Uh, here we don't have models. We don't have models of cats and dogs. And I think this is a, a very, very important difference between, uh, so what does uh, uh, system one and what does system two or what does neural nets and uh, what we do when we write algorithms. And uh, here lies the difficulty also, a big difficulty is how to bridge the gap between the two worlds. Now, uh, let me say uh, something about uh, uh, the design of systems, uh, uh, autonomous systems. I work on the design of autonomous systems for autonomous vehicles. And um, of course, the problem here is how to make these systems trustworthy. And um, uh, what I did for aircraft is the following approach. This is a standard approach when we build uh, controllers for aircraft, for trains, for nuclear plants. You start from, uh, you write your software, you analyze your software, and then you deploy your software on some uh, platform. And uh, here there are also uh, very well de defined uh, techniques uh, to cope with the kind of failure of your execution platform. 
So this, there is well-established uh, practice that these can be applied to simpler systems. Uh, uh, and uh, we cannot, we don't know how to apply to uh, systems that are uh, autopilots for cars, for instance. Now, the approach taken by companies like Tesla or by Waymo is that, okay, as we don't know how to apply this model-based approach, uh, they take a data-based approach. So they train a huge neural machine. So the input here of this machine is frames, for instance, and the output is just the steering angle and uh, uh, okay, the acceleration, deceleration uh, signal. So this is uh, a huge system that is trained for uh, many, 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 many hours. Okay, for uh, by through simulation also. And once they feel that it is well trained, then they implement it. Uh, they put it on board. On some execution platform, and uh, you have systems that will drive cars. Now, the problem for these systems is because we don't understand how they 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 work. Uh, of course, they have very good performance, and if you try to apply model-based approaches to uh, uh, for perception, uh, this will be a disaster. So these systems are unavoidable. The question is that you don't have enough guarantees or you don't have at all guarantees. And my idea is that you should try to combine the classical, the conventional approach that is model-based with the machine learning uh, enabled approach to build systems to have a hybrid design flow where some components will be model-based and some components will be uh, uh, machine learning enabled. And I think that it makes sense for, for cars to assume that all the perception uh, functions are uh, machine learning enabled and all the decision perhaps should be model based. The problem is, and uh, okay, I don't know. This is an open problem. And the, 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 the gap here is that for machine learning approaches, I mean, in, in a rigorous approach, machine learning modules should be considered as black boxes. And uh, I mean, like, like a black box of, of which you can evaluate the, the reliability. Uh, so let me try to explain why the classical approach does not work any, any way. So this is the model-based approach. And uh, I don't see how we can extend it uh, to uh, machine learning. So the model-based approach, when we build the software, we know the nominal behavior of the system, and we know which says states are trustworthy. And of course, the nominal behavior should be contained in the trustworthy states. Now, when we try to evaluate the trustworthiness of the system, we and, and to guarantee some properties, we play the following game. We make some risk analysis, and uh, we identify all kinds of harmful events. And uh, the purpose of the reliability engineer is uh, to uh, uh, interpose, to put between the non trustworthy states, the fatal states, and the trustworthy states, non fatal states. And then, if harmful event occurs, it goes to a non fatal states from which recovery is possible. So, I've done this work for aircraft. And uh, it's a, a, a pretty tedious analysis, but it's doable. And, and uh, I don't know how to do that for, uh, for, for self-driving cars. I don't know how to do that. Why? Because for self-driving cars uh, interact with uh, very, very complex environments that are uh, So here I give, I'm giving you as an example a failure typology for cars, it's impossible to analyze this and to make the same type of analysis I did for aircraft. So we should find other techniques and I'm working at that. So just to say that uh, it's, it's not, it's not uh, easy to apply the conventional techniques, but I don't know either how to do that for uh, machine learning techniques, because the problem is the reliability of the execution platform. 
And then also it's very important now to say that uh, uh, in some industry, uh, they now realize that uh, machine learning enabled approaches are not good enough for cars. And there is a, a, a paper by Mobileye. Uh, you know, Mobileye is a very important player in, in, in uh, uh, autonomous cars uh, area. And they explain how to build uh, systems by applying, uh, autonomous systems by applying uh, model-based approach. Uh, it's good that Mobileye and also NVIDIA wrote papers in that direction, but uh, this is far from being uh, good enough. So here they give some formulas, they make some analysis, but uh, uh, I think that the problem uh, of uh, autonomous systems is that you cannot uh, safety, safety separately from performance. Just to give you an example, uh, if I have a, a car that is overtaking another car in a two-lane road, uh, the overtaking car should uh, uh, move as fast as possible, and uh, so safety is not is not is not good enough. Uh, and this is a very hard problem for for uh, so to respect safety constraints and also to 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 meet the performance requirements. So this is a very hard problem. So I am currently working on the design of autopilots, and uh, uh, I understand that. For situation awareness, we will need machine learning enabled techniques. And uh, the perception function would be good if we want guarantees to uh, uh, develop it uh, with a model based approach. And uh, all the decision process uh, looks uh, very, very, very complicated. Okay, I'm not going to explain this, but um, you have to deal with uh, uh, goals at uh, a different abstraction level, short-term uh, goals and long-term goals, it's, it's, it's uh, fairly complicated. So if you have questions about uh, uh, the work I'm doing on autonomous cars, perhaps I can answer them. And now I would like to finish by saying a few words about validation. So how we can validate autonomous systems. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, simulation uh, will be a technology that will be of paramount importance. And um, so autonomous, uh, uh, autonomous cars, uh, industrialists have uh, very complex simulation systems. And uh, uh, a good simulation system should be realistic, of course, because, uh, uh, I mean, the conditions, the simulation conditions should be uh, as close as possible to real life conditions and as accurate to real life conditions. But uh, this is not enough because you have uh, very good simulators with uh, that have, uh, okay, fancy simulation environments, but they are like video games. A simulator also should be semantic aware. What I mean by semantic awareness? The simulation system dynamics should be, uh, you should have a clear notion of state. What is the state of your system? And, and the, the, the user of the simulation environment should understand this notion of state. And also uh, having a notion of state is uh, uh, very important for repeatability of experiments. And then, of course, you should have some notion of coverage when you do some experiments and states are very important because you see uh, there are some statements by some companies like for instance Waymo they said oh uh, our system is uh, good enough because we have simulated uh, 27000 cars uh, running uh, for so many millions of miles and simulated uh, i mean but this means uh, from an engineering point of view, this means absolutely nothing. This is an empty statement because perhaps you have cars that are simulated, but in the conditions, you need at least some coverage criteria or how many different situations you have covered and to what extent. And what is what are 
also to have a, a notion of what is a dangerous situation and things like that. So uh, just to say that we are quite far from uh, achieving validation of such uh, systems. And uh, also these, uh, I've seen simulators used by industrialists. Uh, we are quite far from what we need because we need a multi-grade and a multi-grain and multi-scale uh, simulation, and we don't have enough theory. In particular, we should be able to simulate uh, what we call cyber-physical systems, so systems that uh, consist of uh, electromechanical components and, and computers. So there are a lot of problems still that to, still to be addressed. Now, what about the modeling language? Because you need, if you use a simulator, you need an adequate modeling language uh, to describe some, such systems. So what are the basic concepts? Uh, in my laboratory, we have defined such a model language. It's called DRB. Uh, uh, let me explain uh, how many different concepts you need to de describe a system of this kind. So a mobile system with cars. Uh, a system will be a set of motifs. So a motif is a world well, live component, component instances, so everything is dynamic. And the motif has a map with an address function. So a map is a shared data structure. Uh, then the nodes of the map, uh, the vertices are locations, uh, so where components are sitting, and of course the address function can change, and components can uh, interact, and also can be, you, uh, can you apply configuration rules. And configuration rules means that components are mobile. They can cre be created or deleted. And of course, the, the map also can change. So you need a lot of concepts to describe properly things. And this is uh, an example of what we can describe DRB. So you have uh, a, a motif that is a road chunk map and the communication map. You have different maps, different motives. And then you have interaction rules. So the interaction rules will say, you see that here you have for all uh, A and A prime of type VGIC, if the distance, the distance is less than L, then you can exchange the speed and you have mobility rules. Uh, you need adequate languages to describe these systems. And so far we don't have uh, uh, we, we don't have such languages. Now, let me finish by saying a few words about, about the validation of, of these systems. So, uh, uh, everybody understands that machine learning systems cannot be formally verified and cannot be formally verified because if you have a system that separates between cats and dogs, you cannot specify formally what is a cat and what is a dog. And this is hopeless, I think. And uh, OK, I, I don't share the optimism uh, of some colleagues about what we can do with machine learning systems. Now, uh, one classical way to verify systems is by formal verification. I got a Turing, a Turing Award for that. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not either optimistic about the possibilities of the techniques we have developed, because they apply to small systems and also the systems with static architectures. Once the system, once the system becomes dynamic and reconfigurable, uh, formal verification techniques have uh, meet serious limitations. And another problem for formal verification is that we don't know how to formalize requirements. And that's a problem. And this is, it has to do, again, with the complexity of the environments of autonomous systems. So here, this is uh, formal requirements for self-driving cars. And uh, I let you read some of these. I mean, it's very, very hard to analyze such requirements. I did this for aircraft, for satellites, but for this, it's impossible to analyze and, and uh, to formalize. So now it's time to conclude. Uh, an important question is how, what the feature will be like. Uh, I think that after many years of excitement, now uh, uh, autonomous vehicles manufacturers revise their ambitions. So that's a good thing uh, because they understand that uh, things are not as uh, uh, easy as they expected. In fact, being, building an autonomous car has nothing to do with uh, 
building uh, a system that plays check. Nothing, nothing to do. I mean, the, the, the nature of the problem is uh, you can have very, very intelligent systems that uh, uh, play Go or play uh, uh, checks, but, but, but this is not, I mean, uh, the problem is very different. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it's very important for the research community to unite their forces and uh, try to not to oppose data-based and model-based approaches. And I think that this is something that is uh, a very, very important idea. Uh, try to uh, find trade-offs between performance and trustworthiness. And, and, uh, and this is uh, something I believe it's, it's uh, very important for the future. Also, I think that the transition towards uh, fully autonomous systems will be very progressive. So we'll have to build systems that will uh, share their tasks with uh, humans. And here the problem, and this is a very, very important issue, how to make systems and humans collaborate. That's a huge problem, very, very important problem. And uh, uh, okay, I have some ideas about how to do that, but you should have uh, very well-defined protocols. Uh, if suddenly the system says, oh, please take over because I cannot handle the situation, the situation should be manageable by humans, of course, because otherwise it would be a disaster. And then, of course, uh, 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 for the future also, I think uh, the, uh, uh, the organizations that decide about uh, regulations and the application standards uh, will play an important role. Today, I have explained that in the United States, you have this uh, idea of self-certification. Uh, so uh, autonomous cars are self-certified. This sounds like a joke that Mr. Tesla says, oh, my car is good enough. You can, uh, I mean, you can use it. And uh, of course, one problem here is the lack of standards. We don't have standards. The standards that uh, are applicable to model-based approaches are not applicable to uh, systems with machine learning approaches. Another issue will be uh, what will be uh, how people will behave and the society. Will the society accept to grant uh, the power of decision to systems even though we don't understand how they behave just because they can do uh, things more efficiently than we can do? Uh, at least in Europe, people are very skeptical about that. Uh, in the European law, in the basis of the European law, you have this uh, precautionary principle. The precautionary principle says that if there is even a very uh, low probability uh, that uh, uh, something very bad, serious happens, then don't use the system, which uh, is not the attitude taken I mean, uh, these principles are not adopted by the U.S. law, for instance. Okay, just to finish now, I think that we are living a grand revolution where machines uh, uh, are called to replace humans uh, uh, in, in, in large organizations and uh, replace humans in, in, uh, in decision-making processes. So this is the first... Uh, uh, toward general AI, I think, uh, no doubt about that. Of course, the role of autonomous systems will uh, depend on choices we make about when we trust them, when we don't trust. And uh, I think it's very important for society to give uh, themselves the means to make informed decisions. That's very, very important for the future of humanity. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, is there any question for Joseph? We, we just uh, time for one question. Hong Jiang, you have a question? I don't have. I don't have. I don't have. Hi, Joseph. There is a question from a nominous attendance. Do you think the hybrid method will truly have the AI? or applications like AV to take step further. Uh, I think that you have answered the question. We might have to think in other communities. Uh, can, you, can you see the uh, Zoom, the, the question in the Zoom window? Oh, let, me, let me try where yeah. I can see this. 
the Q Q A uh, or questions? Yes. Okay. Q A. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There are two Zoom two webinar chat. Yes. One to answer. Yes. Okay. Send me the question because I cannot see it for the moment. So Zoom Zoom webinar chat. I cannot see, but say okay. it in English. Uh, th this question instead. Will the future ubiquitous network, such as a mobile network, totally designed by AI? Sorry, what kind of mobile network? Uh, the future ubiquitous network, such as mobile network, totally designed by AI. No, no, no. I mean, this is a, sorry, sorry. I mean, sorry to give it such an answer. I mean, this is completely <laughs> it's a, nonsense. It's too broad, too general no, question. no, no. No, no, it's a too general question. But anyway, I, I don't think that, I mean, you don't expect any creativity. I mean, you should understand what neural networks do. Uh, neural networks apply some interpolation techniques, but neural networks cannot replace. So, of course, neural networks can get as close as possible to system one, to our system one. But system two works differently. So, system two deals with concepts, okay? deals mm -hmm. with concepts and and all the tented, uh, the attempts to formalize con concepts of natural language have failed completely failed okay i mean it's a different approach these are two different worlds they are complementary so uh, uh, neural nets they are fine as long as they are applied to what automatically distinguish uh, between between concepts or to, to do some interpolation work, but that's it. I mean, neural nets cannot be creative. Neural nets, I, I, it, it's, it's funny. I mean, if, if I see, if I, I show neural net to neural nets, apples falling from, from a tree, okay? Will they discover the laws of gravity? Come on, I mean, let's be serious. Because the laws of gravity, you need some kind of abstraction and the abstraction is based on concepts. So this, this, I mean, it's 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 completely. I think here there is a completely. I mean, these are completely misleading ideas. We should uh, use neural networks for what they are good to do. Okay, nothing more. And here I think there are many over the ex expectations. That's a pity, really. Okay. Okay. Now, now I can. Time I can, for, for I can the read the question. I can read the question. Okay. Okay. Very fine. okay, thank you. The idea of hybrid design flow combines data-based and model-based approach. I believe we will eventually have to adopt the hybrid approach in almost every case. The question is when we will we use the data-based approach and when we use the method. That's a very good uh, question. Thank you. So I'm working at that. I think that all the decisions should be model-based. And this is, I mean, you, we should inspire from the way our, uh, our brain works, our mind works. So when we decide, when we play with our consciousness, we decide, we, uh, we decide, of course, you can decide automatically, okay? But most, I mean, of our reason decisions uh, are used uh, uh, based on models and based on criteria we have. So uh, our brain combines uh, 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 machine learning, I mean, machine learning, learning, automated learning and conscious learning. So we should do that. For me, uh, all the decision making process should be uh, model based. Of course, you can be assisted by, you can be assisted by uh, machine learning modules, but the main decision should be uh, uh, model based. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, very time much. Is up. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We hope thank to, you very much. Uh, to see you in the future online, another online uh, forum, maybe. If, if COVID-19 allows, yes, uh, I would be happy to visit Beijing again. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah, bye. 好的，非常感谢 Joseph 给我们做的这个演讲啊，因为他这个。我们确实要解决这个 AI 的可信度的问题啊，确实需要更多的这个像像 Model Check 类似这样的历史上在芯片设计啊等领域非常好的数学的验证手段啊。